When you think of a healthy earth, what do you see? I see plants, animals, the sun shining, clean water, and I see humans. Yet many of the things humans do can damage the earth. My name's Valerie and I'm the Outreach Coordinator for Future Energy Systems, or FEZ. FEZ is a research program at the University of Alberta focused on studying the energy transition. Thank you for joining us to learn about land reclamation. Land reclamation is the process of taking disturbed or damaged land and returning it to its past condition or turning it into something new. Essentially, it's healing the earth. I went to school for a really long time to learn about land reclamation or being an earth doctor. So I'm really excited to guide you through these clips to learn all about land reclamation. In this first part, I'll teach you about the basics of land reclamation, then guide you through designing your own healthy ecosystem. We also have a card and dice game that you can download if you wanna try all the steps of being an earth doctor. Here are the supplies you'll need. Have fun. So becoming an earth doctor or land reclamation, that's what we're gonna talk about. So what do you think land reclamation is? Have you guys ever heard it used in your classroom or from your parents or on the news? When I think of land reclamation, I think of being an earth doctor. So what is an earth doctor? Well, first think about what a human doctor does. Any ideas? So when a person gets sick or they injure themselves or they want to make sure they don't get sick, they might go see a doctor. And just like humans, the earth can sometimes get sick. And an earth doctor helps to heal the earth when it gets damaged or broken. It can also help maintain the earth's health or prevent it from getting damaged or sick. So land reclamation is the process of converting disturbed or damaged land to its former or other productive uses. The reclamation plan that we develop for each project is based on what the land is going to be turned into. It's end land use, as we call it. But do we need reclamation? What do you guys think? Our human population is increasing at a really drastic rate. And with that, we need to clear more land for food, homes, have more resources for industry and for jobs. So we are creating a lot more disturbances, which means we need a lot more reclamation. But first, what is a disturbance? So a disturbance is a change in an ecosystem. It can be negative or positive. But damage or degradation, that means a negative change. So can you guys think of any disturbances in Alberta? What about other parts of the world? Well, I have a few. We have pipelines. We have mining for coal, metals, oil. We also have building cities, building roads for transportation, forestry where we're cutting down all these trees. And disturbances can be really long. So something like a city or roads, those are gonna be there for a very long time, but others might be much shorter. So like pipelines or mining, they'll need to be reclaimed much quicker. So now we're gonna talk about a few words we use when we think of reclamation. The first is restoration. That's a type of reclamation where it's the process of reassembling the community or ecosystem after a disturbance with the goal of returning the site to what it was prior to the disturbance. So we're going back to what was there before. But the hard question is, is this even possible? There's so much unknown in ecosystems that it's very difficult to return what was there before. So restoration is more commonly used when the intent is to restore through actions that will return the site to its prior state. So for example, planting certain species or creating the landscape in a certain way it sets the stage for longer term restoration. The next word we're gonna learn is revegetation. So that is when we are trying to provide vegetation or plants on a barren or disturbed landscape. It can be done actively when we're actually planting or passively when we let the plants come in on their own because there might be plants around them. So when we're doing revegetation, there's a few things we need to think about. We need to think about what the plants need. All plants have certain requirements, how much water, what climate they live in, how much nutrients they need, and many other things. So you need to make sure the plants you pick fit the ecosystem you have. You also need to think about where are you getting your plants? 
Are you collecting your own plants or is someone collecting them for you? Are you buying them or are you getting them from your surrounding ecosystem? So there's a lot of thought about where you're going to get those plants. We also need to think about how we're going to plant those plants. Are you going to seed, which can be very quick and cheap? Or are you going to use transplants, which is a lot more expensive and takes more time, but transplants can often be more successful. Finally, you need to think about what plants are needed. Are there community groups in the area that need certain plants for food or for medicine? Are there animals in the area that need certain plants for shelter, for food, for survival? So there's a lot of things to think about when we think of revegetation. And the next word we're gonna learn is remediation. So that's the focus on the removal or reduction of contaminants or unwanted substances. Contaminants could be a gas spill or metals in the soil or even salt in the soil. There's a lot of things that can be contaminants that we don't want there. And the technique that we pick for remediation depends on what the contaminant is. Some techniques don't work for all contaminants, as well as how much money you have to spend and how much time it'll take for the technique to work. Sometimes if the contaminant is putting the surrounding environment at risk, you need to use a very fast technique to get it out of the soil or the water or the plants. So now we're gonna focus on a couple different techniques. These aren't all of the remediation techniques, but we're just gonna have a quick look at some. So some techniques don't actually remove the contaminants from the soil. Dig and dump removes the soil and puts it in a landfill. Encapsulation stabilizes the contaminants in the soil on site so that they can't escape. On the other hand, thermal desorption uses heat to remove volatile contaminants. So they heat up the soil and gases of contaminants will leave. Bioremediation uses microorganisms to remove contaminants, often by adding nutrients or adding extra oxygen and mixing up the soil to allow the microorganisms to remove those contaminants. Phytoremediation does a similar thing, but instead of microorganisms removing the contaminants, it's the plants themselves that are removing. And finally, we have natural attenuation, which is the natural ability of the soil or the water or the plants to remove contaminants without human intervention. We have to be careful if we're using natural attenuation to make sure there isn't risk to the surrounding environment, as well as that the contaminants will actually remove over time. And finally, we're gonna talk about soil reclamation, which is actually what I studied in my PhD. So often in land reclamation, we have to improve a soil or build a new soil. Any ideas why we might have to do that? Well, soil is often stockpiled, which means it is taken from the ground and placed in a pile during a disturbance. So that way we can use that soil again at the end. But sometimes that soil quality isn't very good after it's been piled up for a long time. And in some sites, the soil isn't saved or there isn't any soil to save. So there might not be any there. So why don't we let the soil just come back naturally? It can take thousands of years for soil to build up naturally, so we need to find shortcuts to help it come back quicker. So one of those techniques is to build a soil, and that's what I did in my PhD. I built soils using mining waste material. So I built my soil out of crushed rock and human poop, and I mixed that together to create something that could support vegetation. And we can use waste materials to help build those soils or to add to the soil to make them better, uh, things like manure, so cattle or pig or chicken manure. Uh, and there's other materials that we can use as waste. And that helps us use up waste materials and have a better soil. So the final thing we're gonna talk about really quick is reclamation and energy. Alberta is rich in natural resources, especially energy resources with conventional and non-conventional conventional oil and gas. Due to this, Alberta faces major reclamation challenges due to the size of the disturbances, potential cumulative effects, which is all the effects coming together, and technical issues, things like tailings ponds, saline soils, salty soils, that we don't always know how to deal with. And there are many other places in the world that face these similar challenges. But we also need to consider 
How is reclamation going to change as our future energy changes? What reclamation is going to be required for wind turbines, large solar farms, and many other changes to our energy ecosystem? So we need to think about reclamation and energy now, but also reclamation and energy in the future. And now it's your turn. So you are gonna design your own reclamation plan. So well, thank you so much for listening. And we're gonna get right into that now. Hi everybody, thanks so much for learning about the basics of land reclamation with us. Uh, so now we're gonna try it ourselves. So if you go below, you can find the link to download this image. It is pretty much an empty landscape. So if you can, print it at home. If you can't, maybe use an app on your computer to color it on there. Uh, if you do print it, grab some crayons, grab some markers, grab some pencil crayons. You can see I've already started filling in my image with my pencil crayons. But this is an empty landscape. There's pretty much nothing here. There's no soil, there's no plants, there's no animals. And it's gonna be your job to make this a healthy landscape by thinking about all the things you just learned about reclamation. So number one, you need to think about what you want this landscape to be in the end. Is it gonna be a forest? Is it gonna be a wetland? Is it gonna be a city park? So once you've decided on your end land use, then you're gonna start filling in the image. So as I said, I've already started filling in my lake. Now I'm gonna start uh, planting some bushes. So I'm making sure that I have lots of vegetation to provide food and shelter for the animals that might live in this area, but also to protect the soil from blowing away or washing away. So earlier today, I completed a drawing of a lake uh, that I have reclaimed. So I have all of these different layers of soil because soil is made up of different layers. Uh, we also have some worms in the soil, some animals living underground. I've planted some flowers along the top because this is going to be an important butterfly habitat. And then in my lake, I've made sure I have food and I have shelter with these rocks, as well as making sure I put the sun in because without the sun, our plants won't grow and animals wouldn't have anything. And if you happen to have any stickers at home, now would be a good time to start filling your landscape or your ecosystem with them. So I've got a butterfly that I'm gonna put in the sky to eat all of those lovely flowers, so to get their pollen from the flowers. I've also got some bugs. Bugs play a really important role in all different parts of the ecosystem. They break down plant matter to make food for other uh, plants and animals. They also uh, can aerate the soil, which means add a lot of oxygen to the soil by moving the soil around. I'm also gonna add a fish because we don't wanna have an empty lake. We wanna make sure our lake is full of life. So now it's your turn. Make whatever reclaimed ecosystem you want, but make sure you think about all the different parts of reclamation. Your plants, your animals, do you have any contaminants? Everything like that. When you're done, Send us your picture on Facebook at Future Energy Systems. Let us know how it went. We're also gonna post the rules to a game called Become an Earth Doctor that we have created, uh, the Land Reclamation International Graduate School created. It's gonna take you through all the steps of reclamation and you have to decide how you will successfully reclaim an ecosystem staying on budget and staying on time. So are two really big challenges in this game. You don't need much at home, so uh, check out the rules below for that game uh, and make sure to download your reclaimed ecosystem. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye. How did your ecosystem turn out? Feel free to share them with us on Facebook or Twitter. Now we're going to meet Meg, who is studying peatland restoration. Peatlands are a special kind of wetland, and we'll be joining Meg at their research site to find out some of the things that can disturb peatlands and what impacts this can have, especially on how they breathe. At the end, Meg will walk you through how to build a terrarium, which is a self-sustaining ecosystem. Here are the supplies you'll need. Get exploring! Hi everybody, my name is Meg. I'm a peatland scientist. I'm currently doing my master's in peatland restoration at the University of Waterloo in Ontario. And today I'm going to give you a little bit 
of an idea of some of the damages that we do when we're actually looking for oil and gas and other fossil fuels. So it's not just the burning of fossil fuels that causes an issue, uh, it's also looking for them, exploring for them, finding out where they are, getting to them, getting them out of the ground, getting them to the refinery for them to be made into things like gas for our cars and um, electricity for our houses. So this is, um, I'm actually in a peatland, so it's a special type of wetland, but oil and gas exploration happens everywhere. And basically whenever we disturb the ground, we wreck all of the functions that nature has in place. So plants, as you know, take up CO2 um, or carbon dioxide when they essentially breathe uh, and then they convert it and release the product as the byproduct as oxygen. This is important because CO2 is one of the big greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which create a layer that traps heat inside the atmosphere instead of it being able to escape out into space. And this is what causes what we call the greenhouse effect and then in turn global warming. So I'm actually standing on, uh, these are called seismic lines. And this is one way that we find oil and gas in Alberta and across Canada. Um, but basically they are long straight grids of lines that we cut so that equipment can go through and look for the oil and gas under the ground. So basically they're called seismic lines because it's a seismic process that they use. So that they send sound waves into the ground and then much like echolocation, bounces off the different formations underground. And then at the surface, it can be captured and actually read and then mapped, um, the underground can be mapped. So this is how then they can see if there is oil and gas and if there's if there's enough of it to actually go in and, and want to extract it or anything like that. So as you can see behind me, uh, these seismic lines, they stretch for many, many kilometers. Um, in Alberta alone, there's over 345,000 kilometers of seismic lines, and that's enough to go around the world um, over just over three times. So that puts in a little bit of perspective, and that's only Alberta. We do this all over Canada. Through all sorts of systems, we do it through the peatlands, we do it through forests. Uh, you can see behind me in the background where all those really tall dark trees are. That's where the peatland ends and it goes into forest a little bit. And if I spin you around here, you'll just see how, as one of my awesome field assistants doing some work for me while I film, um, but you'll just see all these seismic lines and how far they all go. And then you think about this being all over Canada. So it adds up. Um, and in the past, we always thought that seismic lines would recover and grow back on their own because, you know, they're long, but they're really narrow. So the trees should be able to come back and, um, and regrow and everything. It shouldn't be a problem, right? But these lines that I'm on are all 30 or at least 30 or 40 years old. We're not sure exactly, but we know they're at least that old. And as you can see, there's no trees. <laughs> so um, as I mentioned, one of the issues is that disturbed land actually releases more greenhouse gases because you take away especially the trees and those trees are all made of carbon that's all stored carbon and from co2 that they've taken up from the atmosphere and, car and nutrients that they've they've taken up from the ground through their roots um, so all of these trees that are missing here multiplied over all of that area across Can Alberta and Canada is a lot of carbon that we lose and then on top of this when we change the conditions, we essentially mess up Mother Nature's systems and we create the conditions to produce methane is the co most common one. So when we take out all the trees and the equipment runs through, it compresses the ground and actually makes it a little bit lower than the surrounding, which also makes it wetter. And under wet conditions, um, CO2 isn't produced because there's no oxygen. That's second part. It's carbon with two oxygen um, atoms attached. And if there's no oxygen, they have to use something else. So in this case, methane is produced when they actually use hydrogen. So methane is CH4. So carbon, for every carbon, there's four hydrogen attached to it. And then that basically seeps up and either comes out as diffuse, so very 
uh, kind of stable across uh, in very, very small particles, or it'll actually come up as bubbles. And we actually see bubbles come up in wetter sections um, on here, and there's lots of people who actually measure them. The scientific word for bubbles, if you want to know, is ebullition. <laughs> so it's your word for the day as well. Um, so, yeah, so this is all a big problem, because multiplied out, we know, we've done studies, we know that seismic lines and other disturbances like uh, logging, and uh, we harvest peat, especially for our gardens. Peat moss comes from bogs and fens like this in peatlands. Um, oil and gas, the, uh, the oil sands you probably all know of. Um, so all of that, anything that we do that disturbs the ground and takes away vegetation and exposes all that carbon and changes the processes, um, and takes away the protection that's actually holding it all in, uh, that all contributes to our greenhouse gas budget and how much we're releasing. Um, so what I'm doing for my project uh, is actually looking at ways that we can restore these seismic lines with different treatments and seeing how that affects um, the CO2 and CH4 release. But I'm not going to go into that too much, um, but I am going to take you over and show you how we actually measure the different gases and figure out where they're coming from and how much is coming out. So to actually measure how much CO2 and methane is being taken up or produced, this is our fancy machine here. So it's called a LICOR and basically what happens is it draws air in through the tube. It goes through a bunch of analyzers and stuff and then it tells us on the screen here how much of each gas is in that. And so I had mentioned about plants photosynthesizing and taking up CO2 and then the soil respiring CO2 and methane and how we actually measure that. So if I put a clear chamber like this one on the collar, the light can get through so the plants are going to be taking photosynthesizing and taking up CO2. Then if I put a dark chamber like this one on, the plants can't photosynthesize, but the soil will still respire and release that CO2 and carbon dio or CO2 and methane. Um, so then we can measure the difference between the two and figure out how much is the plants and how much is the soil. So now I have the dark chamber on here and Basically now all of the gases that are coming off are being trapped inside there and the concentration is building up. So then you can see here, this is actually measuring them as they go. So this one here is CH4, that's methane, and then the CO2. So as you can see, they're both going up. So methane is being produced from the soil and so is CO2. And if we let that run for a little while, we can actually see how much is being produced and how quickly it comes up. Then we switch over here to the light chamber, meaning that the light can get through and the plants are all photosynthesizing. Now if we look again, our numbers should start going down for the CO2 at least. See, now 343, 41. So it's going down because now the plants are able to take up CO2 again. And they're actually taking up more CO2 than is being released from the soil. So the CH4 though, the methane, you'll see, is still pretty high and it's still going up a little bit. And that's because methane isn't influenced by the plants or by light. It's gonna be produced anyway, um, regardless of what we're doing on it. So even though the natural areas still emit CO2 and methane, the disturbed areas are actually emitting more. So that's how we know that disturbance due to oil and gas exploration and extraction is actually contributing to greenhouse warming. Um, and our, my research so far has showed that the, the lines are emitting, the seismic lines here that I'm on, are emitting more CO2 than the natural areas next to them. 
And I'm actually specifically looking at ways to start restoring these seismic lines. So bringing them back so that the trees can grow back and they start actually taking up CO2 again and storing it instead of releasing it. So there is a little activity that you guys can do to simulate the CO2 um, cycle. So how the plants take it up and so they photosynthesize and then how the soil respires it and breathes it out and how it actually kind of circles around and how in an undisturbed system that's all working properly, they actually balance out. And that's by building a terrarium. And I'm going to collect some materials while I'm out here and then I will show you how to put it all together when I get back. Okay, so now we're back in my kitchen. I've collected some materials for, to make a terrarium and I'll show you how to put it together. So I collected everything from out in the woods where I was working, um, but we'll give a li list and a link to all the materials you need uh, so that you can actually collect all this stuff at home and in the city. Um, but first thing you need is some sort of glass container. Uh, so the lid can be, uh, solid but the container has to be glass this is just a pickle container um, so this one's pretty small but you can do whatever size you want you can also buy a, a glass jar from somewhere or uh, whatever suits your style or whatever you have around i just like using things that i have around the house and that keep it out of the garbage um, so first thing you want to do is you're going to need some soil and we're just going to make a layer because we're basically making a little ecosystem in here. So we're gonna add some soil to the bottom. Doesn't have to be a lot, just enough for your little plants to have something to pull some nutrients from. So I'm gonna do about that. And because this one is pretty small, I'm not gonna put a whole lot. I did collect a few little plants, but I think now looking at my container, a lot of them might be too big, so I might not use some. But I also grabbed some moss while I was out. And you can find mosses in some like greenhouses and things. Um, you can collect it from outside, from around uh, in, you know, around in nature, in the woods or whatever. Just make sure that you grab a little bit of whatever it was growing on. So this stuff was growing um, on the ground in the dirt. So it's got a little bit of dirt still in the bottom of it. If it's growing on a log, make sure you, you take a little piece of the, the wood that it's growing on as well. And then basically, all we're gonna do, a spoon or a fork, chopsticks, anything like that works pretty well for this, is just place it in there where we want it and make sure that it's sitting down in contact and kind of nice and snug in there. I think this little guy might, if you're collecting plants, make sure that you're collecting it from somewhere that one, you're allowed to, um, and that you're not taking, if there's only one of something, it's usually a good idea to not take it uh, and make sure that you get the root system. I'm just gonna stick this away. He's a little bit big, but I'm gonna bury, put the stem down a little bit because plants are super adaptive and he'll be able to grow even if I bury the stem a bit. Just gotta work him in here so that he fits, he's the right height. And keep in mind when you're doing these things, there's not really any perfectly right way to do it. Sometimes some of your plants won't survive. It happens. Then you just pull them out. You can put something else in if you want. Um, but yeah, basically just taking all of your, your bits and pieces and arranging them in ways that, in a way that you like, that makes the jar look cool, how you want it to look. You can also add some more decorative pieces into it, it can be as simple or as complex as you want. So I just have a couple rocks here. Again, this is a really small jar. This is kind of too small for all of this, but I'm gonna do it so that I can show you all. So yeah, we can add some rocks in there. Basically just arranging everything to make whatever sort of landscape you want inside the jar. And then 
because I said this is a closed ecosystem, so basically the plants will be taking up CO2 and the soil will be uh, releasing CO2. And as long as it's closed, it just cycles around. But we do need some moisture. You're gonna get light from the jar. You wanna keep it out of direct sunlight, obviously, because it'll burn it, um, but we need some water. So you're just gonna add, you just want enough to just dampen all your soil. So this is actually, you can see there, I've got a little bit on the top. So I actually put a little bit too much in. So no harm, uh, you wanna start with, start with just a little bit and add little bits at a time. That little bit, you can see a lot of it's already been absorbed actually. But for this then I would just leave the, the lid off for a day or two and keep an eye on it and just let that water evaporate before closing it up. So if I were to close it up though, then now the only way that the gases can go is cycle through and uh, all the moisture and everything will be kept in here. If it's too wet, you'll start to see it'll start to kind of fog up and condense on the sides. Uh, you can wipe that down. You can leave it open for a little bit. If you think that it's a little bit too dry and things start look looking a little bit wilty, you can open it up and add a little bit more water. Um, but once you get the right balance of things in there, it'll just keep going by itself. Eventually you might have to uh, open it up and trim some of your plants because they will get big. They'll fill up the jar. Some people like to leave them so that they look totally wild and totally fill it. Other people like to keep them trimmed and small and, and looking nice. Um, but yeah, as far as that goes, it's basically up to you. And I'll, uh, we'll provide some links and some information with different plants and the materials and uh, some more links to maybe more detailed uh, tutorials for how to do this because there's lots of lots of resources lots lots of videos out there um, this is another one that I made this is actually just some of the mosses from the peatland where that I was showing you, you can see a couple of the individual pieces have really taken off it's a little bit foggy so it's a little bit warm in there or a little uh, wet in there right now so I'll just show you and this is a, a peanut butter jar <laughs> so that's what it looks like on the inside and the cool thing about mosses is they actually don't have root systems and they don't need soil. So I was able to take some established ones and stick them in there because these types of mosses don't grow on dirt anyway. So yeah, that's just a real quick and quick and dirty kind of tutorial on how to make a terrarium. Um, I hope this video has been a little useful and you've learned at least something. If you're interested in pursuing something in STEM or in environmental, uh, in the future. Happy to answer questions about all that as well. And uh, otherwise, yeah, thanks for listening. So what plants did you put in your terrarium? I can't wait to hear how they're doing. So now you know the basics and have been to the field. So let's head to the lab. Here we'll meet Yi Hen Zhao, who will show us around their lab and share their work using carbon-based materials to clean up heavy metals to remediate contaminated soil or water. Let's explore the lab. Welcome to the University of Alberta Land Reclamation Lab. My name is Yi Han Zhao. In today's video, I'm going to give you a lab tour and show you what I'm studying. First, I should explain what land reclamation is. Land reclamation is the process of converting disturbed plants to its former or other productive uses. It can involve removal of contaminants from water and soil. Our mission is to turn this a coal mine to this. Now, let's explore the lab. We have many things here, like workbenches, um, like things and storage oven microscope like fridge incubators we have lots of storage of things from volumetric flags to beakers to test tubes and more. Chemicals are locked up in these cupboards. I work here in the lab 
for my work, I'm looking at removing tamas called heavy metals. Heavy metals are metallic chemical elements that have a relatively high density, such as cadmium and lead. Soil and water can be contaminated with heavy metal from many industrial activities, such as mining. Heavy metal contaminated soil and water pose a serious public health issue. Its accumulation, uh, which means more and more buildings up in plants, including vegetables from soil, is the main exposure pathway for human beings. Other animals can be exposed this way too. In my experiment, I'm going to compare three different carbon-based adsorbents to see which is better at removing the tablets. Adsorbents are usually a solid material that acts as a sponge that sticks and holds other materials um, like heavy metals. By comparing the different adsorbents, we will know which one we should use for reclamation and to reduce the risks of heavy metals by removing them from the ecosystem. This will make more land available for us to use for farming because we will have removed the metals. If we have more land uh, available for farming, then we have less likely to run out of food. The adsorbents I'm testing are two types of humic substance products and keto manure biochar. Humic substances are dark organic residues of decaying organic matter. The two humic products are made from coal. Biochars are charcoal-like materials. Cattle manure biochar is made by burning cattle manure. To test how well these materials absorb the heavy metals, I need to use a shaker. This is used to mix bland or argitated substances in a tube or flask by shaking. First, we mix the heavy metal solutions, which has a known amount of lead in it, then put adsorbents in it and shake for 24 hours until they reach adsorption equilibrium. This is when no more heavy metals can be absorbed or attached to the material. Now we filter the remaining mixture using a syringe filter. This removes all the remaining adsorbent particles from the liquid samples as they may interfere with my following measurements. Then we take the liquid that we filtered and we analyze how much lead is left in the sample in a commercial laboratory. This allows us to know how much lead the adsorbent removed. Essentially, if we know we put like 100 mg per liter lead in at the beginning and there is like 20 left in the liquid at the end, then we know the adsorbent removed 80 mg per liter. We then repeat this with all of the adsorbents to see which removes the most lead. As a land reclamation scientist, I work as a nurse doctor. This type of research can help us investigate ways to help the earth. By understanding which adsorbents is better at removing tablets, heavy metals, we can help heal the earth from human activities and make a positive impact on the world we share. Are you ready to be an Earth Doctor now? Thanks so much for joining us today to learn about land reclamation. Make sure to subscribe to Future Energy Systems YouTube channel so you don't miss any of our exciting content. And check out the links below. There's so much to learn as we explore our energy future.